Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on undergraduate abstract algebra based on my book, Algebra in Action, a course in groups, rings, and fields. This lecture is on ring homomorphisms and their kernels, and it's based on section 16.1 of my book. So let's get started. So the overall plan of at, at this part of ring theory is for us to define ring homomorphisms. Whenever we have an algebraic object, we define subobjects like subgroups or subrings. And then right after that, we define group homomorphisms, or in this case, ring homomorphisms. We do that because then we want to see which one of the which kind of subrings occur as the kernels of these homomorphisms. And then those kernels will be called ideals. And those are going to be exactly the kind of subrings for which we can define quotient rings. So quotient rings will be defined using ideals. This is exactly the same thing that happened in group theory, um, although we didn't sort of start it this way, but I, by, by the time we studied group homomorphisms, uh, we understood that this to be the case in the sense that normal subgroups, which are exactly the kind of subgroups that allow you to find um, quotient, um, quotient groups are kernels of homomorphisms. So here we're doing it the sort of the more natural way, which is defined ring homomorphisms, which is a very natural definition, and then ask what, what kinds of subrings are their kernels. And then after that, after we have all of these, we can talk about isomorphism theorems or homomorphism theorems. In this lecture, we're going to do those top two things, define ring homomorphisms, and then talk about their kernels. The other ones will be relegated to uh, future lectures. OK. Definition of ring homomorphism is exactly what you might expect. Um, if you have two rings, and if you have a map from uh, a function from R to S, then this is a ring homomorphism if it preserves the, the uh, operations in the ring. The ring has two operations, an addition and a multiplication, and the ring homomorphism has to, um, has to, sat satis has to satisfy the following things. So for a both A and B in R, we have to have phi of A plus B, is phi of A plus phi of B. So what that means is that if you know where A goes, it goes to phi of A. If you know where B goes, it goes to phi of B. Then you don't have a choice for where A plus B has to go. A plus B has to go to phi of A plus phi of B. Um, the phi has to respect the addition in the ring R and the ring S. When we do A plus B, we're adding in R. Phi of A plus phi of B is the addition in S also. And, but, but this is a ring when we have multiplication in, the, in addition to addition. And so phi of AB has to be phi of A times phi of B. Again, A goes to phi of A, B goes to phi of B, and then AB, the product of A and B, you don't have a choice where it goes. It has to go to, to the product of phi of A and phi of B. And again, AB is the product in R, phi of A times phi of B is the product in S. Okay. There's more vocabulary that we can use. The, the, the rest of this vocabulary is not really necessary. You can just use the word homomorphism as well as one to one and onto and so forth to use them. But we like new words because it makes us um, uh, feel smart because we, we have jargon that we can use. Um, so if you have a homomorphism from R to S, R is the domain, S is the codomain. If R and S happen to be the same, so you have a homomorphism from a ring to itself, then that's called a ring endomorphism. So an endomorphism is always from something to itself. If, if it happens that phi is one-to-one -one and onto, a homomorphism that's one-to-one -one and onto, then that's called, as you might expect, a ring isomorphism. And if you have a ring isomorphism, you say that R, between R and S, then R and S are isomorphic rings. And what we do is we write R isomorphic to S. The notation for isomorphism is an equal sign with a squiggly uh, thing on top of it. So our so two rings are isomorphic if there is an isomorphism. An isomorphism means that there is a perfect translation, a one-to-one -one onto map that's not only one-to-one -one onto, but, but it's a homomorphism. And so you can translate any ring theoretic um, statement in R to a ring theoretic statement in S and vice versa, you can translate back. So as far as ring theory concerned, those two rings are the same. Um, they might look very different, and they might have properties outside of ring theory that are not the same. But as far as ring theory pr theoretic properties are concerned, the two will be the same. They have both the same addition and the same multiplication table. 
if R is S and phi is one to one and on two, so you have an isomorphism from a ring to itself, then that's called an automorphism, a ring automorphism. So a ring automorphism is an isomorphism of a ring with itself. Now you might say, well, a ring is of course isomorphic to itself. Why would you want that? Well, an automorphism tells you how you can move the elements of the ring around and yet preserve the operations. So automorphism is a kind of a symmetry of, of the ring. And so um, just like if you have a ge geometric object, you might want to study its symmetries. If you have a ring, you might want to study automorphisms because it tells you sort of what its symmetries are. And just like a geometric object, the automorphisms of a ring also form a group. Okay, so an example of a, uh, a homomorphism is, is, a, is this map, a map from the integers z to integers mod n, um, uh, where, uh, where addition and multiplication is uh, mod, modular n, z mod n z, and you define where do you send an integer m? You send it to the remainder of m when divided by n. Um, this is a homomorphism because if you have two numbers um, and if you want to find you can either find the remainder of this when divided by, by n, then the remainder of that one when divided by n, and then add the remainders. Or if you add them and find the remainders, you get the same thing. Um, now, and the same thing with products. Um, um, so, so and that makes it a homomorphism. So it doesn't really matter whether or not you find remainders before or after adding and multiplying them. Of course, if you if you find remainders and add them, you might have to take a further remainder because it might go over um, what, uh, uh, what n was, but, but that's okay. Still, you get the same thing. Now, this is an onto homomorphism because you can get every uh, z mod n, z its elements are zero to n minus one, and you can get those, any one of those remainders, and, um, but it's not a one-to-one -one map. So two numbers that have the same remainder go to the same place. Um, other sort of more, and another more trivial example is that if you have any two rings, then you can define a very, uh, a very silly map, which is to send every element of the domain R to the zero of the codomain. Now, whatever the ring S is, it will have a zero. And so, um, and so you might want to send everything to zero. And, and that will certainly be a homomorphism as well. And, um, and, uh, it's called the zero homomorphism or the trivial homomorphism when you send everything to zero. Of course, um, it's not onto unless S is uh, uh, just the zero ring, just a ring with one, one element. Um, and, and certainly it's not uh, one to one, again, unless R is just the ring with uh, one element. Some very basic properties of homomorphisms. So we'll take R and S be our two rings and uh, just for uh, emphasis, I've given different names to the addition and multiplication of R and S, R with plus and dot, and S with circled plus and circled dot are our rings. And, uh, and let's say that we have a homomorphism from R to S, R is the domain, S is the codomain. If you take A and R, an element of R, then we can say the following thing. First of all, if you ignore multiplication and you just focus on addition in R and S, well, R with the plus is an abelian group. That's what a ring is. When, when you have a plus, you have a, um, with plus, you have an abelian group. And S with its plus, it's also an abelian group. And the map phi, if you ignore multiplication, then you have a group homomorphism. And so all the properties that group homomorphisms have, phi will have. So in particular, zero of R goes to zero of S and the negative of every element goes to its negative. So phi of minus A is minus phi of A. And you would prove this just like you would be in, in, in group theory. Um, now, if for multiplication, though, R may or may not have identity. But if it does, if one is the identity, then you would suspect that phi of one should, can't just be anything. And phi of one is the identity not of S, but of phi of R, phi of R being the image. Um, and, and, and this is a subtle point that uh, needs a, a little bit of emphasis, that phi of one is going to be the identity of phi of r. Now, if, if S happens to be an integral domain, and, um, and if phi, uh, uh, then, then phi of one will be the identity of S as well, because as we saw in a previous lecture, in integral domains, 
um, if you have a sub ring with an identity, then that identity will be the identity of the whole ring. But not in general, that will not be true. And if A inverse exists, again, if you take an element in R, it might not have a multiple of inverse. But if it does, if it's a unit, then phi of A inverse can't just be anything. It's going to be the inverse of phi of A, but the inverse of phi of A in phi of R, not the, index of phi of, the inverse of phi of A in S. Or it could be, but it doesn't have to be. Um, we will see an example uh, to see what, what, what we mean by that. And um, if just like groups again, if R prime is a sub ring of R, then when you phi of R prime, meaning when you apply phi to every player element of R prime, you get a sub ring of S. So sub rings go to sub rings and vice versa. If uh, you have a sub ring of the codomain and you look at phi inverse of that and phi inverse of that, as I've said previously, in, in, is, is, that does not mean that phi has an inverse. For phi to have an inverse, it would have to be a one-to-one -one onto map. But phi inverse of S prime is defined regardless of whether or not phi has an inverse or not. Phi inverse of S prime means those elements of S that get mapped into S prime. So you just say, okay, here's the elements of S prime. What are the elements of S that map into it? And those guys will be a sub ring of R of the domain. So some of these are a little bit tedious, like they have parts to prove. So I'm not going to go through them. I will leave them to you. I will prove um, uh, a couple of them. So I will prove number two and number three. So that for number two, again, phi is a homomorph ring homomorphism from R to S. I want to convince you that phi of one R is, if you send one over, you get identity of phi of R. Well, how do I show that? Well, you take some X in phi of R and you have to show that phi of one R acts like the identity. And, and you do that um, by, by, by seeing if X times phi of one R is X or not. Well, but what X, if it's in phi of R, then that means that it's hit by something. Then that means that it's an image of um, R. And so there's some little R in R such that X is phi of R. And then if you take phi of one times phi of r, phi of r is x again, and I'm trying to see what phi of one times x is, then because this is a homomorphism, I can write this as phi of one times r. And one times r, this is now in, in the ring r, is r, and, phi of, and, and I'm done. So I showed that phi of one times x is x. And this would be true if I did it on the other side as well. Now, for three, I have to show you that phi of A inverse is the inverse of phi of A in phi of R. But how do I show that two things are inverses of each other? Well, I multiply them and see if I get the identity. So if I take phi of A inverse and multiply it by phi of A, what do I get? Well, this is a homomorphism, a ring homomorphism. So phi of A inverse times phi of A is the same as phi of A inverse times A. Note that when we say phi of A inverse times phi of A, that times is in the ring S. Here, when we say A inverse times A, that times is in the ring R, and those might be two very different multiplications. But A inverse times A in R is just a one of R, and we proved that phi of one of R is the identity of phi of R. So we took phi of A and phi of A inverse, multiplied them, and we got the identity of phi of R. So then that means that phi of A inverse is the inverse of phi of A in phi of R. Let's look at an example um, to, to, to clarify this thing about identity of phi of R and inverse in phi of R. So take the map phi that goes from integers mod two to integers mod six. Integers mod two are zero and one. Remainders of integers, when you divide them by two, they could be either zero or one. Even numbers have a remainder zero. Odd numbers have remainder one. Um, Z mod 6 C is 0 through 5, remainders of integers when you divide them by 6. Now, the map is defined by sending 0 to 0 and 1 by th to 3. Since the domain only has two elements, you can directly check that this is a ring homomorphism. Like, for example, you could say, well, what's 1 plus 1? Well, in Z mod 2 Z, it's 0. And phi of 1 plus phi of 1, that's going to be 3 plus 3. That's also 0 in uh, Z mod 6 C. So, and, and zero goes to zero. So, um, so uh, you can just check uh, all, all the possibilities. There's just not that many of them. This is a ring homomorphism. Okay, but uh, now, now look at phi of one. Phi of one is three. Is that the identity? 
It's not the identity of Z mod 60. The identity of C mod 60 is one, but phi of one went to three. But, phi of, but three is the identity of the image, phi of Z mod 2Z. Where does Z mod 2Z go? Well, zero goes to zero, one goes to three. So the image of Z mod 2Z is just zero, three. And zero, three is a subring of Z mod 6C, but its identity is three. Um, not the identity of the whole ring. And, and one of this guy went to three, which was the identity of that sub ring. And, uh, and, it, and again, it's not the identity of Z mod 60. The identity of Z mod 60 is one. Um, also, phi of one is three and the inverse of one is still one. And that goes to three also. Um, and three is the multiplicative inverse of three not in Z mod 60, but in zero, in zero three. So in zero three, if you just look at zero three, then um, uh, three times three, um, uh, three times three um, will, be, uh, will be three. Um, okay. Okay. All right. Because three times three, um, in uh, the, the reason is that in, in Z mod two Z, three times three becomes three, but three is the identity. So that's good. So that means they're inverses of each other. In Z mod six Z, three times three is still three, but three is not the identity there. So three and three are not inverses of each other. In fact, in Z mod six Z, three does not have an identity. Okay, now let's, uh, the main object was, was to think about homomorphisms, but then look at their kernels. Now, if you have two, uh, two rings R and S and phi is a ring homomorphism from R to S, then the kernel of phi, as you might expect, is the same kernel as before, is all uh, as before, I mean, in group theory. So the kernel that's denoted by cur phi is all the elements that get mapped to zero. So the inverse, it's the inverse image of the zero of the codomain. So it's all the elements in the, in the domain that when you apply phi to them, you get zero. So, so that's what the kernel is. Now, um, if again, we have a ring homomorphism, and if again, we forget about multiplication, we have a group homomorphism. And the kernel of the ring homomorphism is the same as the kernel of the group homomorphism. So in particular, all the properties of kernels of group homomorphisms still follow through here, and we still have those. One of those is the fact that kernels control one-to-oneness. So if RNS are rings and fees, a ring homomorphism from R to S, then phi is one to one if and only if the kernel is zero. Um, now, this is a fact from group theory again, because again, this is the same kernel and that same kernel for group homomorphisms controlled one to oneness. So this is, this is also an example of that. In fact, we now know more, we know that with respect to multiplication it also behaves nicely, but we don't even need that part about multiplication and this would still be true. Um, I'm going to give the proof of this, although this proof is fo follows from group theory, and usually I don't do redo the proofs from group theory. It's just that it's simple enough and uh, an argument that you should really know. But note that which direction of this uh, the proposition actually has content. Of course, if phi is one to one, then that means no two elements go to the same place. We know zero goes to zero, so um, nothing else can um, can go to, to to zero. Zero of r goes to zero of s. So nothing else can go to one. So that part is follows from the definition of one to one. The part that has content is the converse. That if you know that only zero goes to zero, why is it that the, the map is one to one? Why is it that somewhere else, two other elements can't go to the same place? And that's what I mean by the kernel is sort of controlling a one to oneness. So assume that the, you know that the kernel is zero. So you know that. The only thing that goes to zero, zero, why is it that the map is one to one? So assume that two other elements, X and Y, went to the same place, phi of X equals phi of Y. But we are in a ring and, and we have addition. Addition is the group property, is the, is the one that gave us a group, a group. So we have additive inverses. So subtract a phi of Y from both sides and you get phi of X minus phi of Y is zero, zero of S. This is happening in S. And because this is a homomorphism, you have that phi of x minus one is zero of s. But the x minus one went to zero, but the kernel, but the only thing that went to the zero was supposed to be zero of r. So that says that 
x minus y, this is a typo, is a zero of r, not zero of s. And, and then from that, we get that x equals y. Okay, now um, uh, one point about uh, this theorem is that, uh, again, this should be zero of r here. Um, and, and x equals y, that means that the map is one to one. One advantage of this thinking about the kernel is that in mathematics in general, we do not like it when we ask questions that have a binary answer. We much rather have a range of answers. So you can ask from a function, are you one-to-one -one or not? And the answer would be yes or no. But if you are talking about a homomorphism, whether or not it's a group homomorphism, ring homomorphism, or a vector space homomorphism, that's called a linear transformation, the better question is that what's the kernel? Because if you know that the kernel is zero, you know that it's one-to-one. -one. And if the kernel isn't zero, it's not one-to-one. -one. So um, by asking what the kernel is, you already know whether it's not, it's not, it's one-to-one -one or, or onto, not one onto, but whether or not it's one-to-one. -one. But um, you know more because if the if if the if the kernel is more than zero, it's it's not just that you know that it's not one-to-one, -one, you have a sense of how far it is from being one-to-one. -one. Okay. Um, so so here's an example. Uh, I, I want to just show you the example. This is the example we saw before. We have the map from the integers to um, integers mod n, and the map is you take an element and a, an integer, and you find its remainder when divided by n, and that's a homomorphism, a ring homomorphism. And so what's the kernel? Well, the kernel is all the things that go to zero. Which things have remainder zero when you divide them by n? Well, there are multiples of n. Multiples of n, and that's a subring of the integers is, um, is, is that. And then uh, you can draw a homomorphism diagram like we would do for groups. So you say that z is going to z mod n z, it's an onto map, and the kernel is going to zero. So uh, we have the integers on the left and we have integers mod n on the right, and, and, and here's the kernel going to zero. And, and when we talk about homomorphism or isomorphism theorems, then we will say a lot more about these diagrams. Now, the, the next, the last part of our um, uh, thing here is, or, or the next part of what we're doing here is to decide what kinds of subrings are going to be are going to be kernels of homomorphisms? Can every any subring be kernel of homomorphism, or or some some subrings are better than others? And uh, for that, we we have to see whether or not uh, kernels have any other property other than being a subring. And here's one. So if R and S are rings, and you've got a ring homomorphism, if you take something in the kernel, and if you take something in the ring then um, and multiply them, you get something in the kernel. Now the kernel is a subring, so you expect that if you add two elements in the kernel or if you multiply two elements in the kernel, you stay, stay in the kernel. But this says more. This says that if you take something in the kernel and something not in the kernel, uh, in the kernel or not in the kernel and multiply them, anything in the ring, you still get something in the kernel. In our previous example, the kernel was multiples of n. If you add two multiples of n, you get a multiple of n. If you multiply two multiples of n, you get a multiple of n. But if you take a multiple of n and multiply it by any integer, you get a multiple of n. That's the, what the point of this, um, uh, this theorem is. And the proof of that is not, is not that, that, that complicated. How do we show that xr is in the kernel? rx will be the same. I'm saying xr and rx because I'm not assuming that I'm in a commutative ring. This is true in general. Uh, but, but the proof for rx and xr would be the same. How do we show something in the kernel? Something walks through the door and says, I'm in the kernel. You don't believe it. What do you do? Well, you just apply phi to it and see if you get the zero. So we have to show that phi of xr is zero. But what is phi of xr? Well, we, are, we have a homomorphism. So this is phi of x times phi of r. But uh, r was in the kernel. So, uh, so that goes to zero. And phi of x times zero is zero. And we are done. So phi of xr is zero. So xr in the kernel and rx would be the same. Um, so given that, we now can, um, uh, so, so, so I'm going to repeat what we just did. If phi, phi is a homomorphism from R to S, the kernel is a subring. So again, that means that being a subring means that you're closed under addition, subtraction, and multiplication. So those are, uh, those are true for the kernel because it's a subring. But more is true. And what more is true is that not, not only that you can multiply two things in the kernel and get something in the kernel, 
but you can multiply something in the kernel by anything in the ring and, gets, and you will have to get something in the kernel. And because of this, we now define ideals. Ideals are sub rings that have this extra property. So you have a ring and you have a subset of the ring. Um, I is the left ideal of R if it's a sub ring of R. So by the way, that means, for example, that it's not empty. And um, um, RS is in I for all R and S in I. So we say left ideal when we're multiplying by elements of R on the left. Um, so elements of R are sort of acting there on the left. And, and when that happens, when R times S is in I, not only it's a subring, but we have that property, we say we have a left ideal. Right ideals are defined analogously. If, if, R is, if you multiply R on the right and you stay in the ideal, you say that you have a right ideal. And an ideal is, or, or two-sided ideal, is when you have uh, both a left and a right ideal. Now, if you're in a commutative ring, which in this course, most of the time we will be, then there is no left and right ideals. I mean, if something is a left ideal, then it's a right ideal and, and vice versa because RS is the same as SR. But, but in non-commutative things, left ideals and right ideals, um, you have those and they might not be two-sided ideals or, or they may be. Okay, so... Um, and um, uh, so one, some examples of ideals for any ring is, is just if you take, just take the zero element or if you take the whole ring and those are called trivial ideals. And, and a, another piece of notation is that if you have an ideal, you, we, we, I will write I less than or equal to R. So less than or equal to just like in groups when we, which we use for just subgroups here I use for ideals. Some people will use the, the I, I is the, like the, the triangle symbol, which what, what we use for normal subgroups. In ring theory, we hardly ever are really that interested in sub rings that are not ideals. Sometimes we are, but usually we're not. Um, and, and most the, the, the items that we uh, like to work with quite often is ideals. And so ideals are where it's at. And then do, those get the less than or equal sign. Um, so, one, so what we have proved is that if you have a ring homomorphism, then the kernel of that ring homomorphism is an ideal. And later we will see that um, um, all ideals are kernels of homomorphism. So this, this, so this means that this is sort of an infant only. If the, um, this property of idea, ideals, that, uh, kernels that we uh, the found out is actually the thing that makes kernels kernels. One final example. So if you take the ring of uh, polynomials with integer coefficients, so elements of Zx are polynomials of any degree, but the coefficients are integers and you can add those and multiply those and you get something just like them and you get a ring. Um, and I'm going to define a function from these to the integers. So you give me a polynomial, I give you an integer. How? The way I'm gonna do it is that I'm gonna take your polynomial and plug two in it. Uh, the number two in for X, whatever, the polynomial is plug in at two for X and you get an integer because the coefficients are integers. Okay, this is a ring homomorphism. And the reason for that is that if you take two polynomials and add them and then plug in two, that's the same as if you had plugged in two first and then added them. And the same with multiplication. P of two times Q of two um, is the same as P of X times Q of X evaluated at two. And so that makes it a ring homomorphism. And what's the kernel of phi? Well, something is in the kernel if you plug in two and you get zero. A polynomial that you plug in two and you get zero will have x minus two as a factor. That does need a proof. Um, you probably are familiar with that from high school algebra, that if you, if you have a polynomial, you're trying to find its roots. For example, if you see that you plug something one in and zero, then you know that, oh, that's a root, so x minus one what might, might, must, must be a factor. And so you can factor x minus one and then worry about the rest of it. Um, we will prove that in the context of uh, uh, future lectures. But, but, but uh, for now, let's just believe that, that, uh, that that's actually true. What we have always thought is true is true. That uh, then if you plug in the, the two in the, a, a, the polynomial and get zero, that means there's an x minus two as factor, which means that the kernel here is all polynomials that you that have a factor of x minus two. So there are x minus two times some other polynomial. Um, that set of polynomials is denoted by uh, this um, um, 
brackets, uh, these pointy brackets uh, with x minus two in them. And I read that the ideal generated by x minus two. We will talk about this more um, in, in the next lecture when we talk about ideals in more generally what we mean by ideal generated by x minus two. But briefly, it means that it's the smallest ideal that can of, of zx that contains x minus two. If you want an ideal, you will have to take x minus two and multiply it by everything else, and you need all of those. And that is an ideal, and, and that's the ideal generated by x minus two. And um, we now, this is the picture we have, that we have an onto map from zx to z, and the kernel is the ideal generated by x minus two that goes to zero. And again, we will work with these more with these diagrams when we have our homomorphism diagrams. So I'm done with this lecture. This was a lecture in a series of lectures on ring theory. This was ring homomorphisms and their kernels. It's followed by ideals of rings, um, a, a, a video on Zorn's lemma and maximal ideals, and then field of fractions. And it was preceded by an introductory lecture, Why Rings, which um, gave uh, motivation for the study of rings in the context of solving Diophantine equations. Then we had basic definitions of rings in neurons of domains and fields. Then we had examples. And then we taught, had a short lecture on subrings and their identities. And there's more after these uh, when we go into um, divisibility and primes and irreducibles and so forth. Till next time.